I got to thinking about this a couple weeks ago. And uh, there's a verse in the scripture that talks about how that the Lord loved the church and He gave Himself for it. <clears throat> and I think that we live in a day and age where there's a lot of things that people think about when it comes to the church, but I don't know if love is one of the words that they, they use. You know, it's, it's unfortunate, and I wish it was not so. Uh, I told the fellows over at the, the jail this morning, I told them about Jesus and how He was rejected when He came into His own and how they received Him not and they were the ones that wanted Him to be crucified and actually wanted a, a thief and a murderer to be released instead of Jesus. And I said this, I said, I would like to say that uh, 2,000 years later we treat Jesus better now than we did then. But I can't say that because I believe that we don't treat Jesus uh, any better now than whenever He was here doing His earthly ministry. They, they denied Him then and rejected Him, and I believe that people today deny and reject the Lord. But we find that the Lord had something that He truly loved. He loved the church and He gave Himself for it. And that tells me that the church is pretty important. Okay? Now I do know this. I know that uh, you can't be saved by having your name on the church rolls. I understand that. And uh, I know that somewhere there is a list of members of Emmanuel Baptist Church. And uh, I dare say that maybe not even everybody on that list is, is saved and on their way to heaven. Uh, but you can't get saved, or you can't go to heaven simply by having your name on a church roll. And I also realize that we're to keep our eyes upon the Lord and not just upon the church. But I am going to say this, I do not believe that you can be right with God. I do not believe that you can be effective in the service for God if you do not put an importance on the church. And yes, I'm talking about the church building. I'm talking about the church people. And I'm talking about the church as far as service times. I believe that if you do not honor these three things, you cannot, you are not right with God. And if you're not, you need to do something about that. The Lord has burdened my heart a lot about the church, and I have, I don't know, note after note after note. So over the next several weeks, uh, I don't know exactly how it's going to work, we're going to talk about some things with the church. And this morning we're going to talk about what is the church. What is the church? Look here real quick in Matthew chapter uh, 16 because I think sometimes uh, the easiest way to show people what the church is is to you have to take them and show them what the church is not but Matthew chapter 16 verse 13 the Bible says when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi he asked his disciples saying whom do men say that I the son of man am who's the conversation about so far thank you verse 14 and they said some say that thou art John the Baptist some Elias and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Who's the conversation about? Thank you, Jesus. Verse 15, He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, who is this passage of Scripture about? Thank you, Jesus. Verse number 17, And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Conversation still about who? Jesus and His Father. Verse number 18 says, And I pray also unto thee, or I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Who is this Scripture talking about? Jesus. The church. Peter is a byproduct. Peter is there. It just so happens that his name is Cephas, which by interpretation means a stone. It's a comparison. You're a stone, but on this rock I'm going to build my church. What rock? Look at the rest of the chapter. You're going to see what it's all about. It's about Jesus. It's not about Peter. It's about Jesus. It's about the church. It's about building the church on who? On Jesus. Verse number 19, I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, who did he give that stuff to? Did he give it just to Peter? No, he gave it to the church, did he not? It's about Jesus, the head of the church. He gave the church some power. That's what this is all about. 
You say, well, Brother Steve, this is just a conversation between Christ and, and Peter. It has to be Peter that he's giving these things to. Believe me, a lot of people trip over that, fall into uh, you know, uh, hypocrisy, I guess, and heresy. But look at verse 19 or verse 20. Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. See, sometimes people isolate those two scriptures right there and they put the emphasis on Peter. But the thing that we have to pay attention to is that the entire passage was always about Christ and what he was doing, how he was setting up the church, what he was empowering the church to do. And we find that the church was present. The disciples were there. Who was the first church? Jesus and his disciples. Those that they won. They were 120 in the upper room. There were thousands that were added to it at the day of Pentecost. And such it should be saved every day after that. Today, we are the Lord's local church. I chose that particular scripture right there because as I said, sometimes it's easier to talk about what is the church when you say what the church is is not. And I want to say this and then clarify myself. The church is not the building. Okay? The church is not the building. Not the church that, that the Lord is talking about. Okay? Now I realize that this building is the church. This is where we show up. This is where we worship. This is where we pay our tithe. This is where our membership is. I understand that the church building is called a church. But we are the church. You and me. The people in this room. We are the church. The church building is just wood. It's brick. It's, it's you know, whatever else it's made out of. You know, uh, uh, siding and, and roofing and different things like that. The building itself, let me follow this all the way through and don't jump on me as soon as I say this. The building itself is not all that important. Because we could still be the church even if we weren't in the building. I mean, we could go out here in this field and we can meet and the church would still be meeting. Now, I'm glad that we have the building. I'm glad that we have the church. I, I love the church and all that kind of... But, you know, the, the building, the church building represents something. It is kind of a, a symbol. And it's kind of us being a called out body of believers. And when we look at the church and when people drive by and say, there's Emmanuel Baptist Church. And when we say we're going to go down to the church, we're talking about the building. And this is just a place that we have in our minds that we, we think about when we say that we're a member of Emmanuel Baptist Church. This place, and this place is beautiful. This place is, is, is wonderful. And I would say that even if we didn't have padded pews. And listen, I, I, I said that whenever I was down at Tabernacle. And those of you that came down to Tabernacle, you, you know we didn't have the nicest of everything. You know we didn't have the, the plush carpet. You know we didn't have the plush pews. We know we didn't have the plush instruments and all that kind of stuff. But it was still beautiful. Why? Because it's the house of God. It was the place that God gave us to meet and to uh, worship and to serve Him out of. A place that could identify us. And we need to identify with the this building. It is the house of God. I want you to think about that for a minute. The house of God. The house of the Lord. The tabernacle. The temple. The holy place. My Father's house. This is where we're at today. We are in His Father's house. This is the house of God or the house of the Lord. Now think about this. When you come into the house of God, who should have the preeminence? God. Now, I'll be honest with you. If I come over to your house, Brother Bob, you are going to have the preeminence. I'm not going to go into a room that you don't invite me in. I'm not going to get in your cupboards and start going through things. You have the preeminence. And I would like to say that if he came to my house, he would give me the same preeminence. I would have control over where he goes and what he does and what he's going to get into and all that kind of stuff. Well, when we come into the house of God, God should have the preeminence. He controls what goes on here. That's very important. Okay? The pastor is the under-shepherd. The pastor is responsible for lead, guiding, and directness. But who, who leads, guides, and directs him? God. He controls what goes on in here. You know, there's a lot of people that whenever they leave the church service, uh, on any given service, they'll complain about something. Okay? They'll complain that the songs that they wanted to be sang weren't sang. They'll, they'll, they'll uh, complain that the preacher didn't preach on their favorite topic or what have you. And if you have a favorite topic, I'm glad about that. But just don't think that that's what's going to be preached on every time you come into the church. The Lord is going to give us what we need. And we don't always need the same thing. You know, we're told in the Bible that we're to preach the whole counsel of God. There's many things that we need to know. There's many aspects of the ministry that we need to learn about. And God controls all of that. When we talked about unity, 
We talked about how important it was for everyone to be uh, uh, submissive to God. For instance, we can't have three people come up here and lead to singing. Can you just imagine that? One person says, turn to song 303, another one says 199, another one says 210, and we all stand up and we don't know which song to sing. You can't have that. You can't just have every singer, and we got a lot of great singers in our church, but you just can't have all the singers get up at the same time and sing, unless it's in the choir. If you want to join the choir, that's fine. We have a lot of good preachers. But all the preachers can't preach at the same time. If so, it would be confusion. God's not the author of confusion. We all know who's going to preach this morning. God's man's going to preach this morning. Now, most likely, that's Brother Doug. He's the pastor of the church. He preaches most of the time here. That's the way it's supposed to be. But we also know tonight, Lord willing, Brother Doug's not going to be preaching. But you know who's going to be preaching? God's man. Jordan Foster is going to be God's man tonight. He's going to deliver the message that God has given him. But see, God orders things. God sets all of this up. And we just need to be submissive unto Him. Instead of coming in and, and, and being a part of the service so-called and leaving and complaining all the time about everything, why don't you come into the service and why don't you commit yourself to the service and let God lead things and just see what God has for you? And I'll be honest with you, it's a whole lot better to do that than to be critical of everything that's going on. There are some people I would hate to be them when I come to the house of God. They watch every little thing that goes on. And if, uh, you know, Gail talked about last night about forgetting the word. If somebody forgets the word, oh, that's the worst thing in the world. They just can't. Why would they get up and sing if they're going to forget a, a, a word? I, I like what Brother Doug said. You know, and I, I know this to be truth. I have been preaching, Miss Gail, and lost my train of thought. Because I got wandering off on what the Lord was telling me inside my head. And there's times, just like Brother Mike had to come back and say, what month am I on last night? I had to come back to my, to my notes, and, and that's what they're there for. But you know what? Uh, everybody is just so critical. The church is very, very, very important to the Lord. And if it's important to Him, guess what? It ought to be important to us. And if the Lord tells us things about the church, for instance, who should be in control and who should have the preeminence, it should be important to us, Brother Gerald, to come in here and make sure that the only person who has preeminence is God Almighty. That means that sometimes we have to be submissive. We have to do what thus saith the Lord. We have to do what God man's, God's man tells us. I know there's a lot of people in the church that when Brother Doug says, get up and sit somewhere else, we don't like that too much. We're comfortable right where we're sitting. Well, he wants us to move someplace else to get us out of our comfort zone. And if that's what God's laid on his heart, that's what we need to do. Don't complain about it. Just do it. Now, we said that the, the church building is wood and brick, but it represents something more than just that. It's a place where we come to meet and worship our Lord, not ritualistically, because if we do that, the ritual becomes more important than the service of God. I'll say this, and I know that there's a lot of people who, who watch us on YouTube, and we've actually even gotten a couple of uh, uh, comments that were negative recently, but I, I want to say this. There's a lot of churches out there that fall line after line after line, not in the Word of God, but in the bulletin. Whatever the bulletin says. And uh, <clears throat> my mom does the bulletin in her church. And I know where all the information comes from. And I know it's not always God's man that gives her all the information to put in the bulletin. Lo and behold, what would happen if God's man showed up and the Lord said, Well, let's don't have any singing tonight. Or let's sing this song instead. Well, no, we've got to go by the bulletin, Pastor. The bulletin says we're going to sing the old rugged cross. We've got to sing the old rugged cross. Their bulletin, their ritual has become more important than what they're at church for. I realize there's a lot of services that there is a certain template that those services fit. I realize that most services we come in, 
we fellowship, we get in our seat because Brother Larry wings the bell, and we take our seat and we get in line, and then normally there's a song that is sang and a prayer that is prayed, and sometimes another song that's sang, there's the announcements given, there's some special music, and then there's the preaching, then there's the invitation, then there's more fellowship time, and I understand all of that's the norm, that's the way the template is, and it's okay if that's the way God orders it, but God at any moment, at any time, should be allowed to come in and change it up just like that. We need to let him change it up. That means that we need to love the church for what it is. It is a place where we come and we worship him, that he has the preeminence, and it's about what he says the church is. When he's talking to the church here, he's talking to the people. Now, I'm glad for what the church represents, a, a sanctuary. Boy, it sure is a sanctuary, especially on Wednesday night, is it not? I mean, I know it's a sanctuary on, on Sunday, but boy, I tell you what, when you go out there and you go to work on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday, when Wednesday night rolls around, you're thankful to have the house of God where you can come in here and just fellowship and, and sing songs of praise and, and have somebody teach you what the Bible says. I mean, it is truly a sanctuary, a place that you can come in and get away from the world. And I think it's the perfect picture of that because it's right in the middle of the week. We're going to work Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, come in here. Then we're going to go out. We're going to work Thursday and Friday and some people on Saturday. And then we'll come back in on Sunday. It's the middle of the week. It's a place where we just need that little bit of something in our lives. It's a, a sanctuary. It's a house of prayer where we come to get refuge from the world and to have our needs met at the altar. It's a place of judgment and correction. That's the part people really don't like. <clears throat> preacher's a good preacher as long as he stays on John 3.16. He's a really good preacher as long as he stays on uh, Romans 5.8 and 5.6 and some of those good verses that we like to hear about, God's love and all that. He's a good preacher as long as he's talking about Jonah and the whale. But boy, whenever he takes... Jonah and the whale and spins it around and puts us in there like we're Jonah, then we have a problem. Can I tell you what? I have never once meant to do that in a message that I've preached. But yet I've had people meet me at the door and say, Brother Steve, that message was just for me. You know, I, I felt like you were talking just to me. And that, that's fine, but I was not. I was preaching the message that God gave. And if He brings judgment, and if He brings a, a conviction and correction, then you need to pay attention to who it's coming from. Are you with me? See, the church is not just another organization. The pastor is not just another president or leader of a club. God is not just another you know, uh, a person who we give fake homage to, although there's a lot of people who do give fake homage unto God. I mean, how in the world can you worship Buddha knowing he's dead and in the grave? I like that song y'all sing. How in the world can you ever worship Muhammad or think more of him than he truly is whenever he's dead and in the grave? And you know, even Peter the other day, he wanted to build a tabernacle to, uh, uh, you know, to Moses and Elias. Listen, they're dead and in the grave. Right now they're in heaven, amen, but their bodies are dead and in the grave. I'm glad we serve a risen Savior, Jesus Christ. There's something that sets what we do here apart from what people call a church. Okay? Now what I say and what I teach on this morning, it, it may not line up with the majority of what churches believe that they are today, but the true church, these things can all be said and be said truly. God's church, God's chosen people shows up at the place where God has set aside for them to show up and He comes in and He leads the show. And He helps them and He judges them and He corrects them and He encourages them. That's what it's all about. It's not about being seen. It's not about singing a song just so that people can say how good of a singer that you are. Hey, listen... I would rather see somebody get up here and sing about Jesus from the heart and know who they're singing about and mess it up every other sentence than to have somebody get up here and dress just right. And by the way, singers do that, when, especially after they get situated and they get a following. Th then they look just right and they talk just right. They come in wearing the same color suits and the same color dresses and everything's choreographed and so on. God's not in that. God's in the singer who just gets up and just sings from the heart because they love God and they want to worship. 
Can I tell you what? There's a lot of preachers that get on the internet and search for a, a thought or a message to bring to God's people. There are certain people that have, have books in their library that they go and there's hundreds of messages in there. And they'll be like one of those deals where they close their eyes and they flip the book and they say, here's what God wants for us today. God's not in that. I had a fellow one time ask me, and believe me, I'm not saying this to exalt me, I'm just telling you to so you know how stupid people are. <clears throat> At a church, talking to me. They wanted, they wanted me to consider pastor in a church. And they sat me down, they asked me all kinds of questions about my beliefs and so on and so forth, about the Word of God, so on and so forth. They asked me the question, where do you get your messages? And I says, well, because honestly, there's only one place to get them. There's only one right answer here. And I said, the Holy Spirit of God gives me my message. I said, I get on the floor, I kneel, I pray, I ask God what do the people need. I read, I study where He sends me. I said, I get the thoughts from Him. I write down what He tells me. Then I get up and I deliver them. Of course, he was impressed. Because the pastor they had before was one of those internet preachers. Was one of those preachers that come up with a little book. There's no power in what a man wrote down in a book. But there's power in what God wrote down in the book. Are you with me? That's what the church is. The church is not led by a man. I love Brother Doug. I will follow him to the ends of the earth as long as he follows God. But you should not follow any man. You should follow God. God has put Brother Doug as our under-shepherd, as our pastor. We follow him to the ends of the earth. There's nothing wrong with that. He's got a role to play. He's got a heavy burden and responsibility upon Him. But not just Him. We have a heavy burden. We have a responsibility. See, this is a service. I like what Brother, did, Brother Doug did last Sunday. He preached what the Lord laid on his heart on Sunday morning. And I mean, it was terrific. And if you didn't get any help, I don't know why, because you should have. But you know what? He comes back in Sunday night... And he says, this is your service. What are we going to do? We don't like that. Why? Because we have to get involved. Doesn't the Bible say be instant in season and out of season? Singers, you ought to already, always be willing to sing a song for the Lord. Preachers, you ought to always have a message for the Lord. Uh, uh, brothers and sisters in Christ, you always, ought to always have a testimony of what you can you know, praise the Lord for. But we don't like it because it leaves things up to Something we can't see, the Holy Spirit. People really freak out when you start talking about something they cannot see. And you start talking about God and they can't fathom it because they cannot see Him. But just because you cannot see Him physically does not mean that He does not exist. And number two, does not mean you can't see Him. I have seen God move in a great and mighty way many times in my life. And I know it had to be Him. You see. And you know where I was when I saw these things happen? 95% of the time I was in the church. And I saw God move in the church. Why? That's where God meets with His people. It's more than just a slogan that you put on the bulletin where God meets with His people. He literally meets with His people right here at Emmanuel Baptist Church, but not just Emmanuel Baptist Church. Anywhere that He has commissioned a local church and set one up and organized one and put His man in the pulpit, that is God's church and that's where He meets with His people. But too many times people want to make it the place where he meets with a man or a board of deacons or something like that. That is not the church. Are you with me? And I mean, maybe this, maybe this lesson today is not what you would expect when somebody says they're going to teach on the church. But I'm trying to describe to you what the church is and what the church is not. Because if you can get the view of the true church, number one, you'll know why Jesus loved it so much. And number two, you'll have no problem falling in line and loving it as well because it will be what God uses to sustain you. The message I preached last Sunday night about the psalmist in Psalm 73, where did he get his help and his instruction? In the sanctuary of God. 
A sanctuary of God. That's where you're always going to find help. It's in the church. It's not just a service that you have to show up to. Are you with me? It's not just a 11 to 12 o'clock service and a, and a 6 o'clock to 7 o'clock service. And, and listen, I have literally had people tell me the service lasted too long. I didn't care. If you don't want to come back, don't come back. I literally had a man tell me the reason he didn't come back to our church down there in Dry Ridge. He says, I was there one day, and I, I guess that day we sang about ten verses of invitation. He said, that's too long. He said, there's no reason to sit there and sing that many songs of invitation. And you know what I told him? I said, listen, at our church the Lord closes the invitation. When we start it, and when He says He's done, then we close it out. And if that's after a half a verse, I have no problem saying, okay, stop, we're done, let's go to the house. But if it's 10 or 12 verses, you all just better sit there and get ready to sing because we're going to sing 10 or 12 verses. But people get uncomfortable with that. People get uncomfortable with people confessing sin. I'm glad that we can confess sin. I'm glad we can get that off our minds and off our hearts. I'm glad we can do it and not uh, be worried about how our brother and sister is going to look at us afterwards. Romans 3.23, is it not still in the Bible? All. Yeah, all. We all sin to come short of the glory of God. And I'll be honest with you, there's some things that I've done I don't mind if you know it. Matter of fact, there are some things I've done God has, has used to strengthen me and to strengthen other people. But there are some things, Brother Gerald, there I've done and you won't hear me testify about over at the rehab center. I'm sorry. That's between me and God. But you know what? If the Lord ever laid on my heart and said, hey, you want to get rid of this? Confess it in the church? I'm glad I have a church that I can do that in and not have it be critical. See, the church is not a called out body of righteous people, self-righteous people. It's a called out body of believers being led by Almighty God in its, in its goals and its, its desire to, to fulfill the Great Commission. People come to church because they need help. People come to church because they're not saved. People come to church because their lives aren't perfect. But in most churches, that doesn't fit in with what they want from their church. What they want from their church is they want everyone to come in looking right, talking right, acting right, and everything's going wonderful in their life. There's no problems, there's no troubles, there's no trials. Everybody says amen. Everybody says hallelujah. Everybody says, you know, glory to God. That's a good place to be if that's where you truly are. But I just find out, in my experience in the church, most people are not always there. And I don't know, I'd like to know, I can't imagine what it would be like to just come to a service where everybody was exactly where they needed to be. I'm talking about right smack dab in the center of God's will, at church for the right reason, ready to give a song, ready to give a message, ready to give a testimony. I don't know what God could do with a, with a room full of people like that. But I do know what He chooses to do with the church. And He chooses to help people. He chooses to correct people. He chooses to get honor and glory unto Himself. You know, the church is a holy place. We should keep it holy. In the Old Testament, everything that went into the temple or the tabernacle had to be holy. Listen, listen to what it says in Exodus 40, verse number 9. And thou shalt take the anointing oil and, the, and anoint the tabernacle and all that is therein, and shall hallow it, and all the vessels thereof, and it shall be holy. And thou shalt anoint the altar of the burnt offering, and all his vessels, and sanctify the altar. And it shall be an altar most holy, and thou shalt anoint the laver and his foot, and sanctify it. And it just goes on and on and on. It talks about everything that's there, and how it should be sanctified, how it should be hallowed out to be used by God. And you know what? You look around, that's what all this stuff is. This, this, this stuff is nice. This stuff has been set aside to be used by Almighty God. We don't have rock concerts here. Huh? We have gospel sings, and that's fine because God blesses that. But you know what? Everything that comes into the house of God should be sanctified. Including us. The church is holy, and we should do everything in our power to keep it that way. You know what? That tells me that God requires from us some time with Him away from this building. Do you, do you get that from reading the Bible? 
that he expects us to fellowship with him more than just the four or five hours that we spend here at Emmanuel Baptist Church? I mean, do you find out that, that he thinks that we need to be with him and, and we need to get right and get sanctified and holy before we ever come into the house of God? If we did that, if we learned that lesson, we might show up and there would be a room full of people ready to go and sold out for the cause of Christ and hard telling what God would do. You know what? In the New Testament, Jesus Himself, He wanted the temple to be kept holy. And He still does today. See, He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He does not change. But listen to what happens in John chapter number 2, verse 13. It says, And the Jews' Passover was at hand. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem and found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and dove and the changers of money sitting. Now let's stop right there if you follow me over there. You know what Jesus didn't do? He didn't come by and pat them on the back and say, Hey, keep up the good work. He did not get in line and purchase the products that they were distrib distributing there in the church. But what he did was something that people say Christians can't do and still be meek. Jesus Christ was, by the true definition of meek, he was meek. But yet he had absolutely no problem getting mad, getting angry, and doing something about something that needs attention. Listen to what he did. It says, When he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overthrew the tables and said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence, make not my father's house a house of merchandise. Why are you a member of Emmanuel Baptist Church? Are you a member of Emmanuel Baptist Church because it's a, a fairly large church and there's a lot of social connections to be made here? I know real estate agents that they choose where they go to church based on the, uh, uh, the income level of the congregation of that church because they feel like if they can get in there and they can build relationships and they can network, whenever Brother Ray's ready to buy a house, they're going to sell him a house. <clears throat> and that is their, their motivation for finding a church. A church should never be too big or too small if that's where God says go. There are people who for financial gain, they choose where they go to church. I want to say this, and I want to say it as clear as I know how, and I want you to understand it as clearly as you possibly can. You do not and you cannot choose where you go to church. Are you with me? You do not and you cannot choose where you go to church and be right with God. You go where He leads. Whenever we left Tabernacle down there, I told, I told Miss Vicki, I said, well, we're going to visit around a few places. We're going to see where the Lord wants us to go. And I said, you know, we might visit here, we might visit there. And, and, you know, first time we went out to visit, we visited Emmanuel Baptist Church because that's where the Lord laid on our heart. And the second time we visited, we visited Emmanuel Baptist Church because that's what the Lord laid on our heart. Are you with me? And every time we went to go someplace, the Lord only laid Emmanuel Baptist Church on our heart. Now, we could have went somewhere else. We could have joined in with them. We could have did all the things there that we're doing here and been out of the will of God. Because God has to lead us to where we are. That's why this is a church. That's why this is a, you know, something bigger than just a social club. This is life-changing, life-altering, serious business that we're doing here. Can I say this? You cannot leave the church until God tells you to leave the church and be in the will of God. You can. Get mad at the preacher and stay home. I had woman, one woman tell me one time, she was so mad at her pastor. Brother Josh, she said that when I give my tithe, she said, I put on there for the building fund. I'll put on there for the mission fund. Why? She didn't want the pastor to get any of the money that she put in the plate. She wanted to make sure it didn't go to pay his salary or, or for his car or for anything else. That's being outside the will of God. Because it's not hers to decide it's God's money. You put it in, you tithe, you throw it in the offering plate. God chooses what He's going to do with it. But see, people don't like that. They want to go back to where they make all the decisions. That's not church. Church is where God is the head. Church is where that we follow Him. And we have some rules and regulations, and they're normally not how we dress. I skim through this real quickly and we'll be finished. 
the church is local. It's visible. It's independent. Do you know a lot of people who go to an independent Baptist church, they don't even know why they go to an independent Baptist church. You ought to know why you want to be independent. There's no governmental bodies in the church. Jesus Christ is the head. He has His under-shepherd, the congregation. That's it. We don't need any organizations. It's an organized assembly of baptized believers. There's only one way in, and there should only be one way out. United together in our faith. Not to have a good softball team. Not to have a good volleyball team. Not to build the biggest, nicest, most beautiful building ever known to man. But to carry out the Great Commission. And I'm sorry if this lesson this morning did not fall in line with what you normally get when people say they want to teach on the church. But if you want to know what the church is, you've got to learn what it is and why it is and learn what it's not and why it's not. I thought about this. The, uh, the people who believe that the church was built upon Peter, they have the wrong foundation that they're building upon. You cannot build upon a man. You like that song, On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. You build a church on a man all day long, it's going to sink. You know, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of religions built on a man. The Jehovah's Witness, built on a man. Mormons, built on a man. The Muslim religion, built on a man for the most part. And if a church stands up and says that Peter was the head of the church and the rock that God was going to build the church upon, they're not, they're not a part of the church that we're talking about today. Do you love the church this morning? I certainly hope so. I mean, I hope you love your brothers and sisters in Christ, but I hope that you love the church. And you love and respect the fact that Christ gave Himself for it. And you love the church because the church is there for your benefit. It's for your training. It's what Sunday school is about. Training, teaching, learning from the Word of God. We could get up here and we could tell little nursery rhymes and stuff like that, but we need to teach you and to train you in what the Bible says. That's why Brother Larry goes into great detail about the doctrines of the Bible on Wednesday. It's not enough that you just have heard of the doctrine before. He wants you to know it inside and out. He wants you to understand it and hold on to it tight because it's a Bible doctrine. But if you don't love the church this morning, you better check up and you better get right before the service ever starts or you're not going to get anything out of it. Appreciate your time this morning.